Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs. Will the Secretary please call the roll? Excuse me, Mr. McCarthy. Thank you. Assemblyman Carter. Present. Assemblyman DeLong. Present. Assemblyman De Silva. Here. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Here. Assemblyman Gurr. Assemblyman Hibbets. Here. Assemblyman Koenig. Here. Assemblyman MacArthur. Here. Assemblyman Wynn. Here. Assemblywoman Taylor. Present. Assemblywoman Thomas. Here. Chair Torres. Welcome to the audience in Carson City, uh, as well as those joining us by video conference in Las Vegas and those listening over the internet. Just a couple housekeeping items for us today. Just a reminder to please silence your electronic devices. If you wish to testify, please sign in at the table by the door and provide a business card to the committee secretary. For those joining us online, please be sure to mute your microphone when you are not speaking to minimize any background noise. When testifying, please turn on the microphone and clearly state your name and affiliation, if any, for the record. Then turn the microphone off each time you are done speaking. If you have any handouts, hopefully you've provided at least 20 hard copies for members of the public to our committee staff. Electronic copies should have been submitted to our committee manager by noon yesterday for members of the committee. We expect courtesy and respect in our interactions during the meeting, even if we do not agree with one another's position. Committee members will be using their laptops to view handouts and other documents. Please do not view this as a sign of disrespect or inattention. Public comment will be taken at the end of the meeting. Each person will be limited to two minutes. In addition, the public may submit written testimony to the committee up to 24 hours after the hearing. Uh, today, we do have a pretty robust agenda. We're going to go ahead and begin with a presentation from the Office of the Attorney General, and then we'll be hearing AB 13. Um, I will be hearing, we're going to go a little out of order and hear AB 52 first, and then we'll conclude with AB 13. Um, so at this time, when the Office of the Attorney General is ready, and I believe we have the Attorney General um, testifying in Las Vegas, and then we have the Chief, uh, the chief of Staff um, and a former colleague of ours, Teresa Benitez-Thompson. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, please proceed. Very well. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Aaron Ford, and I am your Attorney General. Delighted to be here today. Um, I believe accompanying me uh, in uh, Northern Nevada there is my Chief of Staff, Teresa Benitez Thompson, and thank you again for, for having us. Uh, I will uh, proceed with our presentation and over overview of our office of the Attorney General. And again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so my office consists of nearly 350 dedicated and hardworking individuals committed to enforcing Nevada law and upholding justice for the protection and benefit of our citizens. Every Attorney General brings their, their own perspective as to how to protect and improve the lives of Nevadans. The overarching theme I've used to set the intention of our work in this office is a phrase you've heard me say over and over again, and that is our job is justice. To guide my decision making, I have framed my administration by a set of policy priorities. These priorities do not override our statutory obligations, but rather they serve as a lens through which we view our work. I refer to these priorities as the five C's, constitutional rights, criminal justice and reform, consumer protection, client service, and community engagement. Each of these three C's is the moral compass that we use to guide the ways in which our office can serve all Nevadans. As the state's top law enforcement officer, the chief law enforcement office in this state, our office represents the people of Nevada before state and federal trial and appellate courts in criminal and civil matters. We serve as legal counsel to state officers, to state departments, and to most state boards and commissions. And we work with our local, state, and federal law enforcement partners to protect the public. In addition to my written testimony, I have provided committee staff with an agency organizational start, uh, chart. I also invite you to read a copy of the agency's biennial report, which can be found at nv.ag.gov. While that report goes into significantly greater detail, I'd like to highlight a few key accomplishments that the Office of Attorney General has had over the last two years of my administration. 
We have saved over 1.3 billion, with a B, taxpayer dollars by vigorously defending the state against tort claims. This number does not include litigation on other cause of actions. We've entered into settlements with opioid manufacturers, distributors, and marketers, bringing hundreds of millions of dollars into the state to help combat the opioid crisis. We have investigated and prosecuted those who seek to harm Nevadans, including murderers, some of whom committed their crimes in our prison system, abusers and scammers. And we have provided robust constituent services to Nevadans seeking assistance, receiving over 18,454 complaints and 39,000 or so inquiries in the last reporting period. Our office is comprised of several divisions within, uh, with specific assignments related to the Attorney General's statutory responsibilities and the administration of the office. I'd like to now turn to each of those divisions in more detail. Several divisions are dedicated to one or more sacred responsibilities of the office, including seeking justice for victims of crime and protecting vulnerable Nevadans. In that regard, uh, Chief Criminal, uh, pardon me, Chief Prosecution Division is Chief Aly Alyssa Engler. And the Criminal Prosecution Division prosecutes financial fraud, including scams, insurance fraud, workers' compensation fraud, securities fraud, mortgage fraud. Uh, and it also works in the area of sex trafficking, cyber crimes, public integrity cr cases, and crimes that occur in the Department of Corrections facilities. In the past two years, this division has charged several murder cases involving killings, including killings in Nevada's prisons. We also continue the prosecution of Charles Sullivan in regard to a 1979 murder. This is a cold case that we reopened when I took tenure in this office. Um, but it's a 1979 murder of a Reno woman, though the trial was delayed due to the pandemic and other evidentiary hearings. Uh, we have prosecuted hundreds of cases from child sex trafficking to scams and fraud to animal abuse. In the fiscal year 2021-22, the workers' compensation and insurance fraud units filed 308 prosecutions and had over $1.2 million in restitution awarded to the state. As a prosecuting agency, it is particularly important to me that when it comes to criminal justice and reform, we don't just talk the talk, but we walk the walk. Our office adopted within weeks of my beginning my first term a new internal policy to ensure that our charging decisions and bail requests were appropriate and ethical. We incorporate the victim's wishes whenever practical, and we seek justice, not vengeance. Moving on to the post-conviction division, our chief there is Chief Heather Proctor. The post-conviction division handles petitions for habeas corpus in state and federal courts, uh, and the division is also responsible for representing the state in death penalty appeals. In the past biennium, the division opened 185 federal habeas cases and 381 state habeas cases. This division is responsible for implementing, is also responsible for implementing the law passed by this body to compensate those Nevadans who are wrongly convicted of crimes that they did not commit. Moving on to our next division, the Medicaid Fraud Control Division, run by Chief Andrew Schulke. The Medicaid Fraud Control Unit investigates and prosecutes fraud by health care uh, providers in the Nat Nevada Medicaid program. For the past biennium, the Office of Attorney General's Medicaid Fraud Control Unit opened 186 investigations and successfully prosecuted 40, uh, 34 criminal cases involving fraudulent activities by companies scamming the Medicaid system, and we recovered $10.3 million in the process. The MFCU also reviews reports of abuse or, or criminal neglect of patients in facilities that use Medicaid. This unit, focused on community engagement, also partners with medical schools to train students on how to identify signs of elder abuse and of neglect. Moving on to a different division, our Consumer Protection Division, uh, our chief there is uh, actually Mark uh, Kruger, uh, Chief Mr. Figueroa, works in that division as well. He's our consumer advocate. The Consumer Protection Division diligently works to protect Nevada consumers from economic harm. This division has four primary areas of focus, the first of which is advocacy for ratepayers before the Public Utilities Commission, and, there in, and that's what Chief uh, Ernest Figueroa does, as well as the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to ensure ratepayers receive reliable utility services at a reasonable cost. 
We also protect consumers through enforcement of the Nevada Deceptive Trade Practices Act. Thirdly, we prevent unfair markets through enforcement of the Unfair Trade Practices Act and federal antitrust laws. And fourth, the, we work on the administration of the Home Again Nevada Homeowners Relief Program. In the past two years, this division is responsible, responsible for bringing in tens of millions of dollars to the state as a result of settlements with companies that violated Nevadans' consumer rights, such as consumer data breaches. Of note, we negotiated a settlement in the T-Mobile merger that guaranteed that every T-Mobile job in Nevada would stay in Nevada and employee bargaining rights would be protected. Additionally, T-Mobile um, has offered low-cost plans for Nevada consumers and has built out coverage for rural, Nevada's rural Internet services. This team is also responsible for responding to thousands of COVID-19 related complaints, such as price gouging, failure to issue refunds, illegal evictions, and other scams. The BCP also represented ratepayers before the Public Utilities Commission, saving them from increased utilities costs, especially due to the fiscal impact of the pandemic. This includes litigating a general rate case before the Public Utilities Commission that resulted in $120 million in a, of a credit to ratepayers in Southern Nevada. Consumer protection staff also help Nevadans protect themselves from scams through community education and outreach programs. In fact, this week is Consumer, Consumer Awareness Week and you will hear uh, us throughout the entirety of this week either on the radio or, or in, on television or in your inboxes about ways that Nevadans can protect themselves from scams. Moving on to the next division, uh, that will be the Investigations Division run by um, Chief William Scott. The Office of Attorney General Investigators work directly with our prosecutors and local and federal law enforcement partners to investigate a wide array of criminal activities. Since July of 2020, the Investigations Division has completed almost 950 investigations and has referred 440 cases for prosecution arrested 188 subjects, and recovered 61 missing children. Additionally, the Office of Attorney General's Office, of our office provides vital support to Nevada through multi-jurisdictional task forces, such as the IRS Financial Fraud Task Force, the Child Exploitation Task Force, the Healthcare Fraud Task Force relative to opioid-related matters, and the Southern Nevada Human Trafficking Task Force, as well as the Elder and Vulnerable Person Investigation Task Force. There are also FBI uh, task forces, including the Joint Terrorism Task Force that my office works on. The Investigation Division also focuses on engaging with local communities to better foster relationships and trust with the people that we serve. The next office I'd like to talk about is the Office of our Domestic Violence Ombudsman run by Nicole Riley, who does yeoman's work in this area. Nevada holds, unfortunately, the unacceptable distinction of being one of the worst states for domestic violence. The Domestic Violence Ombudsman serves as a liaison with all state and local partners on issues related to domestic violence, to sexual assault, and to human trafficking. The Ombudsman serves as a state-level coordinator with oversight of many of the programs and initiatives including the Statewide C Committee on Domestic Violence and the Nevada Vine, which is a statewide automated system that allows victims to receive timely, accurate information on the custody status of offenders. The next division I'd like to talk about is actually a carryover. Uh, I mentioned at early, earlier parts of my comments that every attorney general comes in with their own priorities. Uh, my immediate past predecessor, uh, Mr. Laxall, created the Office of Military Legal Assistance, and I uh, continued that because it's a great program. Uh, and that is run by Special Assistant Attorney General Don Jensen. The Office of Military Legal Assistance provides pro bono legal advice for veterans and military families in civil matters, and is the first of its kind in the AG offices across the nation. In fact, it, is be, it has been replicated and is being replicated across the nation uh, as a, a best practice on a moving forward basis. Since the program was launched in November of 2015, and with the assistance of our pro bono legal aid partners, the OMLA has helped over 3,650 service members and veterans. Even during the pandemic, the OMLA continued operating virtually particularly assisting military families that were facing evictions. Let's talk a little bit about representing our state. 
Um, and our office represents all constitutional offices and state executive branch agencies, as well as many statutory boards and commissions. The attorneys within these divisions have a broad range of expertise, including in the fields of state and local taxation, business law, regulatory law, election law, employment law, constitutional law, and civil litigation. It is in these divisions that my priority of client service is paramount, though staff also often find ways to incorporate other priorities, such as the protection of constitutional rights. Uh, moving as an example to the gaming division, where our chief there is Darlene Caruso, um, staff in that division advises, advises the Nevada Gaming Commission, the State Gaming Control Board, the Nevada Athletic, State Athletic Commission, and the Nevada Gaming Policy Committee. In addition to daily legal advice, staff also represents the board and commission at monthly public meetings. Litigation in this division includes disciplinary practices, pardon me, disciplinary actions brought against gaming licensees, disputes regarding taxes and fees, and hearings on the surrender of, the game, of gaming licenses, as well as actions to ex add people to the list of excluded persons. Moving on uh, to a division you were, uh, uh, the chief of, whom, of which you will hear from later on today, the Boards and Open Government Division, Chief Ro Rosalie Borderlove runs that. Uh, the Boards and Open Government Division provides counsel to all NRS Title 54 occupational licensing boards on administrative laws and procedure, administrative rulemaking, the law of licensure, and the open meetings law. Deputies in this division attend meetings of the boards and commissions, as well as serve as prosecutor and board counsel in disciplinary proceedings against licensees. Staff also are, are, are responsible for enforcing the open meetings law for all public bodies. Moving on to Chief Greg Ott, who runs our Government and Natural Resources Division. The Government and Natural Resources Division serves client agencies and officials responsible for providing core government infrastructure, such as the Controller, the Department of Administration, the Nevada Indian Commission, and PERS. The division also serves agencies responsible for managing and protecting the state's natural resources and environment, such as the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the Division of Environmental Protection, the Department of Water Resources, the Department of Nuclear Projects, and others. Uh, attorneys in this division helped come to a settlement agreement with the U.S. Department of Energy, as you may recall, um, to remove plutonium shipped to our state without our consent. Moving to our Health and Human Services Division, our chief there is Chief Sharon Benson. Uh, staff in the HHS Division serves as counsel to the Department of Health and Human Services and its many divisions. The Office of Attorney General advises DHHS on some of the most critical matters to Nevadans, which includes services at its divisions of health care, finance, and policy, Medicaid, welfare and supportive services, health, mental health, and developmental services, aging services, and the Division of Child and Family Services. As you can imagine, this team has been absolutely critical to the state's COVID-19 response. Our next division is the Personnel Division, uh, which is overseen by Chief Cameron Vandenberg. Uh, she and her division advise executive branch departments, divisions, and agencies on employment law, including administrative hearings regarding discipline of state employees, judicial review of administrative proceedings, resolution of grievances before the Employee Management Committee, and litigation in state and federal court regarding the employment relationship. Our Public Safety Division is helmed by Chief Randy Gilmer, uh, and that division advises the Nevada Department of Corrections and provides representation in all inmate-related litigation, including poverty and constitutional claims. Staff in this division also participate in the Inmate Mediation Program, a unique program of alternative dispute resolution for inmates. Our Transportation Division uh, is run by Chief Lori Story, the Transportation Division advises the Transportation Board of Directors and many divisions of the Nevada Department of Transportation. Staff in this division provide counsel on many complex transportation matters, and they represent the Department of Public Safety in, in its many divisions as well, including parole and probation, as well as the Department of Motor Vehicles. Moving on to business and taxation, 
That division is run by Chief David Pope. The Business and Taxation Division provides daily legal advice to the Department of Taxation and the Department of Business and Industry and its 11 divisions, including the divisions of real estate, mortgage lending, insurance, financial institutions, the Taxi Cab Authority, Transportation Services Authority, the Labor Commissioner, Consumer Affairs, Housing, Industrial Relations, and OSHA. Attorneys uh, on this division, in this division also enforce the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement and its compliance program to prevent underage smoking. Staff also represents the newly created Cannabis Compliance Board and prosecutes violations of cannabis licensees. Moving on to our Solicitor General's Office and our Complex Litigation Division, uh, that is run by our, our Solicitor General, Heidi Perry Stern. The Office of Solicitor General oversees all appeals before the Nevada Court of Appeals, the Nevada Supreme Court, and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. It also houses the Complex Litigation Division, a team of highly specialized and experienced attorneys who work with staff in all divisions in complex matters on cases that expose the state to great financial liability. Our administrative division I'd like to also highlight. Uh, our office is one of the largest law firms in the state. It represents a constitutional office. Uh, it represents a constitutional office elected by the people of Nevada to serve our state. The OAG has a lean yet efficient staff who supports the daily functioning of this large agency. The, administ the administrative division includes IT personnel, human resources staff, office managers, and legal secretaries dedicated to each legal division. The communications team manages a robust public outreach program to help Nevadans protect themselves from crime and respond to media inquiries. The constituent services team, which is very small, is responsible for, attend for attending to all complaints, concerns, and questions sent to our Office of Attorney General. I mentioned that the CSU is very small because it's fantastic that from July of 2020 to August of 2022, that staff processed more than 18,000 complaints and over 39,000 inquiries. And that doesn't include phone calls and walk-ins into the office. The administrative division also houses the chief financial officer who oversees fiscal analysis, tort claims administration, and the grants unit. The grants unit is currently administering 17 grants for a total of nearly $16 million. The grants unit manages several federal programs focusing on supporting victims of domestic violence and sexual assault, elder exploitation, and gang suppression. The grants unit has developed close relationships with local, state, and federal agencies, victim service providers, and others to administer grants across our state. Now, this, in, everything I just mentioned relative to the administrative division is overseen by my uh, more than capable chief of staff, Teresa Benitez Thompson. Uh, it was a big coup for our office to be able to, to get her uh, services into our office, and we're grateful to her for that. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the future focus of this office. Looking forward, it's clear that we as elected officials have a lot of work to do to build trust. Our nation and our state are divided, and trust in our government is broken. Some of our neighbors trust what they read on the Internet more than the people that live in our communities and the people that are elected to represent them. I often say that as a representative of the government, there are three types of communities that I've encountered, um, one of which is the one that uh, you see on TV, um, Law and Order SVU, in the criminal context where Olivia Benson is testifying and everybody's nodding their heads, shaking their heads, saying, yes, what she's saying is true. It's the Bible, and anything anybody else says contrary is lying. That, that's the high level of trust that some have had in the government. They believe everything the government says. That there's a, a type of community that used to have a high level of trust, but that, that trust has diminished for some reason. Maybe it's something that happened to them or something that they've seen vicariously happen to other folks, but that high level of trust has diminished at some level. Uh, and then there's the type of community, frankly, that, that I came from that had little to no trust in the community, particularly um, uh, in, in, in law enforcement. Um, and it's my, in my estimation, it's my job to augment trust in communities where it already exists. It's to restore trust where it's been diminished and it is to create it in communities where it has never existed before. And so the next two years in my term, my focus is going to be on exactly that, to restore, augment, and create trust in this agency and, and in the state. Uh, we'll do so by doing our job to the best of our ability every single day, 
by providing the best client service, by being transparent about our agency, by following through on our commitments, uh, and by always making decisions that are based on what's in the best interest of Nevadans, all Nevadans. And when Nevadans are in need, we'll continue to answer the call. So with that, Madam Chair, I want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you an overview of my office, and I stand available for questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Attorney General Ford. At this time, I'll open it for members. Uh, any questions? I see Assemblyman De Silva. Is there any others? Okay, let's go ahead and go start with Assemblyman De Silva. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Assemblywoman Teresa Benitez Thompson and uh, Attorney General Ford for your excellent presentation. You know, uh, I've been knowing uh, the Attorney General for a long time. He used to mentor me when I was a student at UNLV. We used to call him Mr. Bowtie Fly because of how fashionable he was <laughs> back in those days. But I have a two two prong question. Uh, one is this: uh, What is the uh, the relationship uh, of the Attorney General's office vis-a-vis -vis the uh, the budding uh, cannabis industry? I know you mentioned uh, uh, building trust uh, with the community, and I had several meetings actually this uh, weekend with some of the leaders in that uh, in that industry and in that sector who had uh, some some questions that I was just wondering if you could uh, if you could extrapolate a bit more on the Attorney General's office uh, office's uh, actual uh, role and actual uh, relationship with this uh, community. And then number two, uh, I know when our current senator, Senator Cortez Masto, was the Attorney General, uh, she had a very robust uh, externship program uh, for uh, young law students, not just here in, uh, at, at UNLV, but also uh, uh, across the country. And I was wondering if you could uh, also give us some insight into how that program is going and uh, whether or not it's uh, proving successful in bringing some uh, talented folks to, uh, to uh, pursue uh, legal careers in public uh, service here in our state. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, T to you, uh, pardon me, through you to Mr. Please go directly to the member, thank you. <laughs> Very well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Silva, great to see you, sir. Um, and I hate to hear that I used to be called Mr. Fly with the bow tie. Hopefully I still have some level of uh, uh, cachet. Or, or as the kids say now, what do they call it, uh, Riz? Hope I have a little Riz, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but it's great to see you, sir. Thank you so much for the questions. The first of which related to the Cannabis Compliance Board. Uh, the, the answer is um, relatively simple. We serve as counsel to the Cannabis Compliance Board. My office is not the policy-making entity. Um, we are not the enforcement agency. Uh, we are the lawyers for the, the Cannabis Compliance Board. Uh, it is that board that has been charged with a developing policy um, related to this industry to regulate this industry, and it is that board's uh, responsibility to um, maintain that public interaction with the, 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 the industry representatives. Uh, my office does on occasion have interactions with uh, that industry to ensure uh, that we are, um, you know, have our ear to the ground on what percolating issues are uh, so that it could also inform the way that we advise the Campus Compliance Board, but uh, we have no um, um, enforcement authority relative to that particular industry. Uh, we help them open meetings laws, we provide them legal advice, and uh, they make decisions based on um, uh, what, what they think is best for that particular industry and for our state. Hopefully that answers your question. If there's a follow-up, I'm happy to receive that. Um, uh, in terms of the externship program, um, thank you. I, actually, I didn't realize that Catherine Cortez Masto had the program. When I came in, um, it, 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 it didn't exist. Uh, and so we created, I thought, but clearly we recreated um, an internship program through my first general counsel, um, um, Rachel Anderson, a professor over at UNLV, uh, that, that created, th that, that I guess reinstituted this robust uh, internship program that uh, during COVID was especially productive because we were able to bring in, as you've indicated, interns from all across the nation, law student interns from all across the nation. As far as Maine, we actually had a student from a university in Maine who was uh, interning with our program. And we do this every semester, including during the summer. And in fact, uh, we're getting, we're receiving um, uh, resumes right now for applicants for our summer internship program. We have actually hired some of those interns uh, and they now serve as lawyers in our office. And so it has been uh, a great experience for our office and for those who participate in this, both internally, but also those students who come in. And it has also been a good pipeline to receiving good uh, um, lawyers coming in as, as, as uh, um, attorneys in our office here. So thank you for those questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Thelma and Thomas. Good morning and thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, good morning to Attorney General Ford. Appreciate your overview of um, your office. But on slide, I believe, three, <clears throat> when you discussed the opiate uh, settlement, 
I was wondering if you could share that number of the, um, of the millions of dollars, because I think that it's something that um, the public should know um, how hard the office worked. And um, that's the question. Thank you very much. Uh, great to see you as well, Assemblywoman. I appreciate that question. Um, I'll have to give you an updated number, but it's probably at 370 million um, over the next 15, 20 years that we will see um, um, coming into the state uh, through various settlements that we have had. We are gearing up a trial now. A trial is scheduled for July the 24th. And um, I apologize. Could you state your name for the record? My apologies. I am Aaron Ford, your Attorney General. Okay. Um, but, you know, we're gearing up a trial now, July 24th. I think we have probably three or four defendants left. We've um, settled with quite a few of them already. Um, and we are working on settlement discussions with, with other entities right now that, that are interested in doing what's best for our state. Uh, but we have brought in over $350 million uh, that will come in over the next uh, decade or so to help abate this crisis. Uh, and that includes monies, I, I want to be clear about this. Um, we. Attorneys general across the nation work in what we call multi-state litigation all the time, where several states, sometimes all states, get together. We sue a particular, I'll make up something, we sue Acme Company for the widgets that it has sold across the nation, uh, and we may settle with them. Uh, and our allocation in Nevada makes sense that it would be based on the percentage of widgets that were sold from Acme Company, uh, and that's multi-state settlements. Uh, this one was a little different. We have multi-state settlements, but the allocations that were afforded to Nevada under many of those were, from my perspective, from my professional judgment, woefully insufficient um, to compensate and to re recompense this state for the damage that opioids had wrought. Uh, and so we rejected some of those. Uh, some of those rejections led to subsequent settlements with the exact same entities um, for, for example, six and a half times as much as we would have received had I accepted the interstate, the, the multi-state settlement. And I say that because, again, it goes back to my five C's and ensuring that we are pursuing justice through those C's, consumer protection, uh, and, and I'm proud of the work that our office has been able to do. Uh, it is not easy being the only attorney general to say no to a multi-state settlement that has 55 others, because that includes states and territories as well. Uh, but I did that, and we received seven, six and a half times as much money a, a month later because I stood up for Nevada. And so thank you for that question because it gives me an opportunity to talk a lot about the work that our um, Consumer Protection Division does. We're very proud of that. Thank you, Attorney General. That's just like how our um, women's basketball team work as hard as you are working for the entire state. And I look forward to UNLV uh, topping out UNR today. And I know we're all still mourning the game um, that occurred on Saturday. Uh, at this time, I'll go to Assemblyman Taylor, who's probably also mourning. <laughs> <laughs> I am mourning. I'm glad I was already online to ask a question because then I have to jump in right now and ask another question. <laughs> um, uh, good morning, um, Attorney General Ford. Thank you so much for being here, and Chief of Staff. And thank you, Chair, for allowing me the question. Um, I would, I would just really begin with you, I, this is connected to the the question of uh, my colleague, Assemblywoman uh, Thomas. I was going to ask, how do you determine um, when we jump into a class action suit with uh, other states, or, or when we stay out, other than money? What, what are the other things that you look at in terms of what's best for Nevada? Uh, thank you very much for the question, Madam Chair. Great, to, uh, uh, Madam Assemblywoman. Great to see you as well. Um, listen, it varies. Um, in the opioid context, for example, there are certain multi-state settlements with some of the defendants that we sign on to, uh, based on the circumstances. For example, if it's a bankruptcy where really no one's going to get any money, then it makes no sense for us to kind of, uh, you know, pursue a different kind of battle because bankruptcy is a different kind of beast. Um, if it is a an entity that has had a, a higher presence in our state than, for example, in other states, and has therefore uh, wrought more damage on our state than others have, uh, then we may go it alone against a particular entity. Uh, if it's an entity that has done that has little presence in our state, then maybe we will join a multi-state settlement under that circumstance. And so these are just a handful of the considerations in the opioid context um, that that we have utilized. 
otherwise. But uh, I must say, generally speaking, for, for most uh, multi-state uh, litigation that is based more on, again, the Acme Corporation that sells widgets uh, type of scenario, it's a lot easier to simply um, to, 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 to divvy up what the damages look like among the states, and it's a lot easier and more, it makes more sense for us to join on those. And so um, it's not a lot of times where, outside of the opioid context, we have not joined the multi-state uh, efforts. Um, whether it be against big tech, uh, whether it be against other pharmaceutical companies or, or whatnot. But in the opioid context, it's particular to the type of uh, um, damage that that particular entity or, or uh, business has wrought here in our state. And that was Attorney General Ford for the record. I, I believe if someone in Taylor has a follow up, go ahead. <laughs> I do. Thank you, Chair. Um, you'll get one more chance here because I have a follow up. So. Um, uh, what, what, what you've mentioned, the hundreds of millions of dollars that, that we as a state can expect over the next few years as a result of those efforts uh, from your office. And so, of course, we all really appreciate that. Where do those dollars go? Aaron Ford, for the record. <laughs> um. very, very good, AG. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's a great question, and I appreciate that. So uh, my Consumer Protection Division uh, did yeoman's work in developing what we call the One Nevada Agreement. Um, because we weren't, the state of Nevada wasn't the only entity that was suing in the opioid context. Other municipalities, Washoe County, Reno, Las Vegas, um, uh, Clark County, Elko County, well, Elko County didn't sue, but other uh, entities are all throughout our country, all throughout our uh, state sued. And we entered into what's called a One Nevada Agreement that it gave us more leverage. Um, and allows us to come up and kept, allowed us to come up with a fair dis distribution among municipalities in the state here. So um, uh, that one Nevada agreement, in addition to legislation that your body passed last session, um, uh, Julia Ratty, Senator Ratty passed a law that uh, created the Committee for a Resilient Nevada, I believe that's what it's called, uh, housed within the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and so uh, to, to be a little colloquial, I bring home the bacon and I put it in their hands. Um, uh, my office has no makes no determination whatsoever on how that money is spent. We brought in $350 million over the course of the next few years. Some of that money has already arrived. In fact, I believe a, a couple weeks back, you probably saw a headline where Washoe County uh, uh, agreed to receive their portion of a $25 million settlement that we had with uh, one of the other defendants. Um, the, the, those committees will make those decisions. Now, the, the one caveat is that those decisions have to be made in, uh, toward abating the opioid crisis. Uh, it cannot, this money, for example, will not be given to you all as a body in, in, in your general fund. Uh, it cannot do that. It cannot go there. It has to go toward abating the opioid crisis, uh, pursuant to the recommendations that come from committees that I chair, for example, the Surge Committee, the Substance Abuse Resource Working Group, I believe is, is the acronym uh, there, and, and other committees that are telling HHS, um, which has its own advisors from um, social workers to addiction experts to um, foster care uh, um, professionals to whatever the name, you know, whatever you may contemplate, they will be making that determination at the HHS level. Thank you, Thank AG, you. And, and I would note that you're wearing that very nice blue blazer, um, and there's a big day today on the basketball floor, so I just wanted to note what with, with the uh, AG was so in such a fly way we're, we're wearing, so thank I mean, you I, so I, much. Thank you, Chair. I mean, Eric, thank well, for the record, I mean, I, you know, uh, one, up, one I think your time's up, AG. I'm just saying this is a, <laughs> it, 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 it's a day of mourning for some, that's all I can say. Uh, <laughs> And let the record reflect A.G. Ford's uh, support for the Wolfpack uh, <laughs> by Shadran. Well, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's nice to see you. And um, I just wanted to talk about a little bit or have you explain a little bit about um, Medicaid fraud. I know um, there's a big issue about um, collecting for Medicaid, and I'm wondering with these investigations, what happens with that? Thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Aaron Ford, for the record. Um, our Medicaid Fraud Control Unit um, is run by Andrew Schulke, and what I'd love to do is to be able to have him connect with you directly and maybe offer, provide uh, in writing responses to that particular question for the entire committee. Um, they are very active. I get I get information about them as I've indicated. They opened up 186 investigations um, and um, prosecuted 34 criminal cases uh, that related to the Medicaid fraud control uh, issues that we have in our state. And they recovered 10.3 million dollars 
uh, and that money, um, I'll have to, uh, again, defer to my Medicaid fraud control unit to determine how it is divvied up because some of our um, um, support comes from the federal government. It's 75 percent uh, funded by the feds and 25 percent funded by us. And so there is a, a divvying of, of sorts, if you will, that has to be uh, considered. And, and we got a comparable question from the Finance Committee, from your Ways and Means Committee that Andrew Schulke was able to follow up with. I will have him, if it's okay with you, Madam Chair, uh, submit that as well to the committee for y'all's consideration. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, members, any additional questions? Seeing none. Um, at this time, we'll now open the hearing on AB 52, which makes various changes to the open meeting law. And then to the Attorney General's office, I believe, from Las Vegas, when you all are ready. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Aaron Ford, for the record, simply here to introduce my chief of our division in this regard, Rosalie Bordelove, who will uh, take the laboring oral on introducing this bill. If I may, uh, Madam Chair, may I be excused for the rest of the hearing, please? Yes, thank you. You may be excused. Um, go please make sure you share your love and support of the Wolfpack with uh, all others you encountered today. Yes, ma'am. Thanks so much. Here's Mr. Abord Love. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, please proceed. Um, I'm honored to be here and appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Rosalie Bordelov, and I'm the Chief of the Boards and Open Government Division with the Attorney General's Office. This division houses the Open Meeting Law Enforcement Unit within the AG's office, in addition to representing many state agencies and governed by public bodies. Assembly Bill 52 includes revisions to NRS Chapter 241, Nevada's Open Meeting Law, and a few other chapters relating to the Open Meeting Law's application. I would like to start with a brief overview of Nevada's open meeting law as it stands today before describing the revisions contained in the bill. Nevada's open meeting law, or OML as I often refer to it, was first passed in 1960 and is considered a sunshine law. Sunshine laws exist in many states and are laws requiring public disclosure of government agency meetings and records. In enacting the law, the Nevada legislature declared that all public bodies exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business. And it is the intent of the law that their actions be taken openly and that their deliberations be conducted openly. This intent is stated in NRS 241.010. When I conduct trainings on this law to public bodies across the state, I emphasize the importance of this provision as it guides the interpretation of the law by both our office and by the courts. Nevada courts have stated that the OML was promulgated for the public's benefit and as such should be construed in favor of openness and transparency. The OML applies to meetings of public bodies, both of which are terms defined in Chapter 241. A public body is defined in NRS 241.015 subsection 4 and includes any administrative, advisory, executive, or legislative body of the state or a local government consisting of two or more people which expends, disperses, or is supported in whole or in part by tax revenue, or which makes collective decisions or recommendations to such a body, and is created by a, the state constitution, a statute, regulation, city or county charter, or ordinance, executive order by the governor, or formal resolution. Subcommittees of public bodies are also public bodies themselves. The legislature is exempt from the OML by NRS 241.016, although it often follows many of the same procedural standards, such as publishing agendas, allowing public comment, and facilitating public access to meetings. The OML also applies to meetings of public bodies, um, which is defined in 241.015 as a quorum of the body together with deliberation or action. A quorum is generally defined as a simple majority of the public body, and deliberation is defined as collectively to weigh, examine, reflect, or discuss, while action is a majority vote. So the OML does not prevent all private discussions by members of a public body, only those involving a quorum. 
Additionally, the OML does not prevent the gathering of a quorum of public body members at a social or professional function, so long as there is no deliberation or action. The open meeting law imposes several requirements on public bodies, including the posting of a full agenda that clearly and completely states all items to be discussed and is posted not later than 9 a.m. on the third working day prior to the meeting. The meeting agenda must be posted on the state's notice website, which is notice.nv.gov, at the public body's principal office the public bo and the public body's website if it maintains one. Any person requesting a copy of the agenda must also have a notice sent to, to them. The agenda outline requires public comment periods at the beginning and end of every meeting or before action items. It further requires that all supporting material be made available to the public when it is provided to members of the public body. Public bodies are also required to keep minutes of their meetings that include the substance of discussions and actions. Exceptions to the OML are few and narrow. Public bodies may hold closed sessions to consider the character, alleged misconduct, or professional competence of a person. They may also receive information from their attorney regarding potential or existing litigation involving a matter over which the public body has jurisdiction and control, and to deliberate toward a decision outside of the agendized meeting. However, action regarding litigation must be taken during an open meeting unless the public body has specifically delegated that authority to its chair or chief executive. Additionally, emergency meetings are authorized under the law, but may only be used to address truly unforeseen circumstances such as disasters or health and safety emergencies. The open meeting law requires the public have an opportunity to comment at each meeting. Reasonable limitations may be time, place, and manner restrictions, but a public body can never restrict comment based on the viewpoint of the speaker. Presiding officers may limit public comment when the comments are unduly repetitious or willfully disruptive. The OML also does not prohibit the removal of a person who willfully disrupts a meeting to the extent its orderly conduct is made impractical. Any action taken in violation of the OML is void, and the Office of the Attorney General has statutory enforcement power to investigate and prosecute violations. Additionally, any person denied a right conferred by NRS Chapter 241 may sue to have the, an action declared void. The public does not have to rely solely on the Attorney General's Office for enforcement. Criminal and civil penalties may also apply to members if the violation is knowing. The Office of the Attorney General strives to assist members of the public and public bodies in understanding and complying with this law. We provide training to public bodies across the state and offer training videos on our website available to anyone. There is a Deputy Attorney General assigned to answer open meeting law questions every day. Thank you for indulging in my summary of Nevada's open meeting law. I'm happy to take general questions regarding the law now, or if the Chair prefers, I can move directly to a presentation of AB 52's proposed changes. I think if we can go into the presentation of AB 52's proposed changes, and if members have any questions regarding Nevada Open Meeting Law, you can ask them at that time. Thank you. Sounds good. Um, Assembly Bill 52 is the result of several meetings of the Attorney General's Open Meeting Law Task Force, which consisted of representatives of public bodies in state and local government and public interest groups, including the American Civil Liberties Union. The goal of this bill is to allow public bodies to run our government while protecting the public's right to observe and be heard in that process. Section two of the bill provides clarification to the definition of a quorum. It provides that when there is a vacancy on a body, that position does not count when calculating a quorum. The law is currently unclear whether a vacant position is counted, which can lead to confusion when a body has multiple vacancies and is trying to hold a meeting. Sections three, seven, 16, 17, 18, and 19 relocate language from NRS 241.034 to separate the notice requirement for administrative action against a person from the notice required to acquire, acquire real property via eminent domain. The change, uh, they change the notice requirements from five working days for personal service to seven calendar days and from 21 working days via certified mail to 14 calendar days. Section three also provides for alternative methods of notice for an employee of the public body. 
Many public bodies make direct employment decisions regarding certain positions, such as the superintendent of a school district or the executive director of a state agency. As such, the public body holds a closer relationship with these individuals than they do with the general public. The alternative notice provisions for employees take into account that closer relationship and the need for a public body to take certain employment actions in a shorter time frame. Section 4 clarifies that action requires a majority of the voting members of the public body, as the law is currently unclear with respect to whether non-voting members are counted when making the calculation of votes necessary. It also cleans up language for purposes of continuity with the provisions added by AB 253 from last session. Section 4 further adds a definition of administrative action against a person for purposes of the notice requirements I just discussed. The definition comports with the existing interpretations by the Attorney General's Office for this term. Lastly, Section 4 cleans up the definition of a meeting to clarify the existing meaning. Section 6 changes the notice requirements for notice to individuals about whom a public body may consider their character to mimic those in Section 3 and provide for the same alternative methods of notice for employees as in Section 3. Section 8 adds language to provide continuity in the chapter as cleanup. Sections 9 and 10 provide that the quorum reduction provisions in the Nevada Ethics Law, NRS 281A.420 subsection 5, applies to all public bodies in the state of Nevada. Currently, the language of this provision does not apply to bodies comprised entirely of elected officials in a county whose population is 45,000 or more unless the official has written advice from an attorney regarding their ethical conflict. The current language is ambiguous with respect to statewide entities and could be construed to apply a different ethical standard to the votes of elected officials in rural counties. The proposed change would apply the same ethical standard and quorum reduction ability to all bodies across the state. Sections 5, 11, and 12 exempt committees of private citizens created by city councils or the Secretary of State to draft the background for ballot questions from the OML. It is clear from the legislative history of these committees that they were not intended to be public bodies, and in most circumstances, they would not meet the definition of a public body. The same such committees created by county commissions already have an identical exemption. Sections 13, 14, and 15 provide that library foundations, parent-teacher associations, and certain university foundations are not public bodies unless they otherwise meet the definition of a public body contained in NRS 241.015. This clarify, clarification codifies existing Nevada Supreme Court case law and is intended to update the statute since the definition of a public body was changed in 2011. That concludes the proposed changes contained in AB 52. Um, in closing, AB 52 makes clarifications and revisions to the existing open meeting law in an effort to strike the appropriate balance between allowing public bodies to efficiently and effectively carry out the public's business and ensuring that the public and the media are able to observe and participate in that business. I welcome any questions you may have. Members, any questions? As I'm in the long. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, question with regards to defining a quorum when you have um, less than the maximum number of individuals um, or dealing with vacancies. Um, how are you balancing that change or that clarification relative to creating a situation where you have a very small number of individuals on a body thus making decisions where the intent of the, the law to establish that body was envisioning a larger number. Rosalie Bordelev for the record. So currently, um, the, the law is unclear, and uh, particularly with appointed bodies, they don't have provisions or the ability to temporarily fill a vacancy pending a future election um, as many city councils or other elected bodies have that ability. Um, so they may go longer periods of time with vacancies. And the problem occurs when, um, uh, I'll use as a general uh, 
example, a, a body is intended to have 13 or 15 members, and there simply aren't applicants for the positions. Um, but it's required to have this many positions based on federal regulation because they make recommendations regarding federal money. Currently, if those vacancies are not filled, you could reach a point where the body is unable to convene a meeting and take action at all. And this is targeted, it, this isn't saying we don't want those bodies to be full. We would like to see people in every single position um, and there be no vacancies. But there are many appointed bodies that, like I said, the body itself does not have the ability and the appointing authority may not have applicants that meet the statutory requirements to appoint into those positions. So the hope here was to get some clarity in the law so these public bodies understand what their limits are and how and when they can act um, if they are missing individuals in some of their positions. Thank you, Chair. Members, any additional questions? I did have one specific question regarding the administrative action in section three, um, page four of the bill. I just wanted to kind of know like the genesis of this um, specifically. And then I also wanted to know if this would apply to meetings, um, the, this would apply to meetings where like there's like an evaluation that has been previously scheduled of an individual, if this would include like those evaluations where they would be having a conversation that could result in administrative action. Um, for example, the evaluation of an employee of that body, um, a superintendent, if that would apply. Yes, and so this is with the notice requirement, not the definition, am I correct? I'm double checking what's in. Um, yes, so this is the noticing requirements. Um, administrative action and against is generally considered to include the termination of an employee. Um, it would also include making decisions um, regarding a license. Um, if you were to, if, if a person held a license, whether that be a business license or, or, or a license for a professional occupation, and you were to discipline that license, that would be considered administrative action against. And currently, notice is required, um, and this is simply changing some of what those noticing requirements are. But notice is currently still required for both. If it were an evaluation of employee, notice would be required both under the administrative action provision as well as the consideration of character provision because you'd be most likely considering their professional competence. Thank you. And one quick follow-up to that. I do notice in here that there is like the language regarding the administrative action that that notice can take place in like four different ways, um, and then one of them in option C, it does say like in the person in the person that is represented by an attorney in connection with that matter. I'm just wondering if, the, if there's already a process in place somewhere in the NRS that determines how an individual can make um, the that body aware that they are represented by an attorney, and then also why that would be seven really? calendar days ahead. And uh, well, I guess that's consistent with the others. Well, some of them are 14 days and others are seven days, and I'm just kind of trying to wonder why the differences. Thank you. Rosalie Bordelov for the record. So I'm not aware of a provision specifically in NRS that would apply to this regarding how to notify. In general, if a person um, is to retain a counsel with respect to any particular matter, that counsel will reach out to the body and, and most of these public bodies are represented themselves. So there are provisions within attorney ethics that if you know an individual is represented, you're required to communicate with that attorney. Um, an attorney cannot go then around and, and go to the individual directly. Um, so this is if you know, and so regularly if, if an attorney is retained to represent somebody, their uh, first action is to go notify the other side that they are being represented in direct communications to them. So this is allowing for that notice to the attorney where there is known to be an attorney specifically. Now the difference in the two um, noticing timeframes has to do with how the notice is conducted. 
So if you send out a process server and personally serve the notice on the individual, that's the seven calendar days. The current requirement is five working days. It's being changed to seven calendar days simply for ease of calculation. Um, the, the change in both of these to calendar days is to make it a little bit easier simply to calculate and determine when that is um, because you don't have to deal with when state holidays arise, that frequently trips people up on the noticing timelines. And then 14 calendar days, the current requirement is 21 working days. Um, that is if you were sending the notice via certified mail. And so that's the difference in the two timelines there because it's the difference in the type of notice. Thank you. Members, any additional questions? All right, I think we are good. So I will invite anyone wishing to testify in support of AB 52 here in Carson City. And just a reminder for, for individuals wishing to testify, everyone will be given two minutes. So I'll go ahead and set the timer for everybody as well. When you're ready, you may begin. Don't forget to state your name and spell your name for the record. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Cadence Matievich, C-A-D-E-N-C-E-M-A-T-I-J-E-V-I-C-H, and I have the privilege of representing Washoe County. Uh, we are here in support of this bill today. We'd like to thank the Attorney General's Office for bringing it forward and for reaching out to local governments in the development of this bill. Washoe County is committed to conducting our business in a transparent and open fashion, and we take the open meeting law very seriously. Uh, we appreciate the, the clarifications that this bill brings, uh, particularly that in subsection four uh, around uh, the clarification of what defines a meeting. Um, there have been times when we could have been more efficient in conducting trainings uh, of our elected officials, but out of an abundance of caution, uh, divided them up into multiple meetings so as not to violate the open meeting law. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Torres, Vice Chair Duran, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jennifer Berthium, B-E-R-T-H-I-A-U-M-E, -E, Government Affairs Manager for the Nevada Association of Counties. NACO supports AB 52, which provides flexibility and clarification on when open meeting law applies to a local governing body. Additionally, the modernization of this law to provide for the use of remote technology enables transparency and public engagement during the proceedings of local government business. NACO would like to thank the Attorney General for his continuous engagement of local government as we address and review the open meeting law. We also thank him for including NACO on the open meeting law task force. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Jessica Ferrado here today on behalf of the Nevada Association of School Boards. We'd like to communicate our support of the bill and thank A.G. Ford for his work on this matter, as well as the timelines they included. They are very helpful for clarifying um, what will be considered open meeting law moving forward and appreciate the, the bill. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mary Przinski, and I'm here representing the Nevada Association of School Superintendents, which uh, is comprised of all 17 superintendents in the state. And uh, we appreciate this bill and the clarifications and the revisions uh, contained within. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to testify in support of AB 52 in Carson City? I don't see any. I don't believe I see any in Las Vegas. BPS, is there anyone on the line wishing to testify in support of AB 52? To testify in support of AB 52, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers wishing to testify in support. Thank you. Is there anyone wishing to testify in opposition to AB 52 here in, Los in Carson City? I don't see any in Carson City. Is there anyone wishing to testify in opposition in Las Vegas? I don't believe there is any. Uh, BPS, is there anyone on the line wishing to testify in opposition to AB 52? To testify in opposition of AB 52, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue.
Chair, we have no callers wishing to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you. Is anyone wishing to testify in neutral to AB 52 here in Carson City? Seeing none, uh, and I don't believe I see any in Las Vegas either. BPS, is there anyone on the line wishing to testify neutral to AB 52? To testify in neutral on AB 52, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers wishing to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you. Well, that was an overwhelming surprise. Um, at this time, we'll, uh, I'll invite the bill sponsor if there's any closing remarks. Rosalie Wardle, for the record, I just want to thank you again for hearing about AB 52 today and um, we're open if any questions come up at a later date. Thank you. We appreciate it. At this time, we'll close the hearing on AB 52 and we will open the hearing on AB 13, which provides the provisions related to governmental administration. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Torres. Good morning, members of the Assembly Government Affairs Committee. A pleasure to be with you today. For the record, Teresa Benitez Thompson, Chief of Staff to Attorney General Ford. Um, I do have um, our Chief for Personnel joining us by uh, telephonically as well. I'll be presenting the testimony on the bill, and then we'll be re referring to Chief Vandenberg via the phone for follow-up questions or more process questions if the committee members have them. Um, there also is an amendment that we'll be referring to on AB 13, so I'll be addressing that as well. The Nevada Whistleblower Protection Act, which is in Nevada Revised Statute 281.611 through 281.671, provides for an administrative process to appeal reprisals or retaliatory action was taken against a state employee because they disclosed information concerning improper governmental action. AB 13 proposes to amend the Nevada Whistleblower Protection Act because the Personnel Commission attempted to create a limitation period for filing of a whistleblower appeal through the enactment of a regulation. And that regulation was the Nevada Administrative Code, or NAC, 281.3051A. However, the Nevada Supreme Court invalidated it on the grounds that the Personnel Commission was not authorized to adopt a jurisdictional rule through its rulemaking authority, and that was State of Nevada versus Bronder, and that was a case in 2020. Therefore, the issue of setting a time frame for filing an appeal comes back to be addressed by the legislature, and AB 13 is necessary to clarify what the limitation period is for filing whistleblower actions, also to reduce litigation, to foster the preservation of re relevant evidence, to ensure that the appeal is conducted at a time when evidence and witness testimony is fresh, and to promote diligent prosecution and to promote finality in the dispute. Additionally, Assembly Bill 13 removes provisions of the Whistleblower Act, which are in direct conflict with disciplinary procedures set forth in NRS Chapter 281 and NRS Chapter 284, including taking away the authority of the administrative hearing officer to order the termination of an individual employee who is accused of retaliation. Under the current version of the Whistleblower Act, administrative hearing officers have the authority to order that an accused individual be terminated from their employment. We are proposing to remove this language because it does violate the employee's due process rights, conflicts with other procedures afforded to the employee under NRS 284 and NAC Chapter 284. That is it on testimony. I'll refer to the amendment now that you have in front of you. The original bill's proposed. It was proposing that the uh, a, a written appeal would be made within 10 working days and uh, in conversations with the Nevada Justice Association, also with the local governments, um, we are proposing an amendment to make that 60 working days and that will bring us in line with the practice of local governments and my understanding is that this would be bring consensus um, along 
with support for this time frame as well. Um, that being said, we stand open for questions. Members, any questions? All right, looks like there are no questions. Thank you. At this time, I'll invite anyone wishing to testify. At this time, I'll invite anyone wishing to testify in support of AB 13. Seeing none here in Carson City and none in Las Vegas, PPS, is there anyone wishing to testify in support of AB 13? To testify in support of AB 13, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers wishing to testify in support at this time. Thank you. Is there anyone wishing to testify in opposition to AB 13? Seeing none in Carson City and none in Las Vegas, BPS, is there anyone on the line wishing to testify in opposition to AB 13? To testify in opposition of AB 13, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers wishing to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you. Is there anyone wishing to testify in neutral to AB 13 here in Carson City? In Las Vegas, I do not see any. BPS, is there anyone wishing to testify in neutral to AB 13 in, uh, on the line? To testify in neutral for AB 13, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers wishing to testify in neutral at this time. The, thank you. I'll invite uh, Ms. Teresa, Teresa Benitez Thompson for any closing remarks. Uh, thank you so much. In closing remarks to the bill, I'll just uh, let it be said that no, uh, very much an open secret that this is one of my favorite committees in this building. And, and part of it is because of the wonderful legislators who choose to learn about and provide governance over this subject matter in government affairs. But really the truth is it's about the staff and the wonderful staff that you have here on the Assembly Government Affairs Committee. So have a great session. Thank you so much. If they realize you have a question, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'll go ahead and close the hearing on AB 52. And we do have some... Fin I apologize, AB 13, thank you. And at this time, we'll go ahead and move on to public comment. I will now invite anyone here in Carson City wishing to testify in public comment. Seeing none uh, here in Carson City, and I don't believe any in Las Vegas. Is there anyone wishing to testify in public comment on the line, BPS? To provide public comment, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Ian Marie Grant, A N N E M A R I E G R A N T. My brother Thomas Kirby was murdered by Reno Police and Washoe County Sheriff's Office during a mental health crisis. I heard the Attorney General say his priority is to restore the public's trust. Well, this past summer, myself and several other families in Washoe County who had a loved one killed by the police requested um, Attorney General Aaron Ford and conduct truly independent fact-finding investigations into our loved one's death at the hands of law enforcement because police investigating each other isn't transparency or accountability, and that's what happens across the state of Nevada um, is police investigate each other when they kill a community member. And my brother's case didn't even get reviewed by the Washoe District Attorney, Chris Hicks, and I think we need to start um, prioritizing the, sanct uh, the sanctity, preserving the sanctity of human life in the state of Nevada, all, all community members. Thank you. Thank you, BPS. Is there anyone on the line uh, additionally that's wishing to testify in public comment? 
Chair, the line is open and working, but we have no additional callers at this time. Thank you. Uh, members, are there any additional remarks from members of the committee before we adjourn? All right, just a couple of reminders then. And tomorrow we will be meeting in room 4100. We'll be having a hearing uh, for three different bills, so please come prepared. Um, as always, uh, we'll be hearing AB 92, AB 174, and AB 177. Um, so we will be getting at 9 a.m. tomorrow. So I'll see members there. This meeting is adjourned.